Welcome to Beyond the Clef. I'm your host, David, and I'm here with Corey Graves from Roma Middle School. Thanks for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, and we got to meet through Tech Tech Band and Orchestra Camp. Yes. We've gotten to have a lot of those chats, and I'm really glad to just get you in front of the camera and, and record some of this stuff. Yeah, I'm excited. Yeah, this is really cool. Well, you have an outstanding program. Thank you. Love everything you're doing. Uh, what I want to talk about a little bit is specific to bands. Yeah. It could translate to orchestra and choir and whatnot too, but specifically I want to talk about kind of taking your kids from the first steps and going all the way through the whole year. Let's just talk about and put that first year in. That's gotcha. right. Okay. okay. So what do you feel like uh, is your overall priority for your musicians at the end of their first year? I want them to do this. Okay. At the, at first and foremost, you've got to sound good. I think what the biggest issue is that when I go to other band programs is that they're so worried about moving fingers and keeping the kids interested and we got to play this song so fast. But if you think about it, if you don't sound good, no one wants to hear it anyway. So right, right. the priority has to be on tone quality first. Sure. And then once you've got an ease and a facility on your instrument, everything kind of plays itself. Sure. So sure. Uh, starting slow is definitely the way to go. Um, there's always a way to dangle a carrot because the kid doesn't know anything beyond what you've already taught them. I think that's really kind of a special case where we teach because we don't have an elementary music program. So it's really um, our responsibility to teach them everything that we need them to know. So slow and steady wins the race, and, and it's been working well for us. So. Okay, so now let's take that down uh, and break it up. Tell me what happens in the first week in your program, first day, first two days in your program. Where do you start with the beginners? Um, that's when we're learning how to enter the band hall. To be real frank, like we don't, I, we, I don't even give them free reign to come into the band hall. Um, on their own. We, we line up outside because they've got to learn that the band hall is kind of their sacred territory. Um, and there's a certain way that it's got to be treated. There's a lot of expensive instruments that are there. Um, we don't want to break them. And I certainly don't want any parents to have to pay for something and then take their kids out and freak out. Oh my God, my kid just broke this tuba. Um, so we're really learning the logistics of the band hall, um, what, where we put our things, where we're putting our backpacks, where we're storing this, and how we're ready to be, be great musicians. Um, we're learning a lot about posture because it takes us a while to actually get our instruments in. Oh, sure. Um, so that's in that time too that we're talking about posture and how to build it. We've got all these chants and things that are going on. Um, basic music theory, like all the parts of the staff, uh, right. the musical alphabet, and there's just so many great games and songs and things that you can spend a lot of time solidifying before you get to the instrument. That way, when they are masters of that, they already got some background knowledge and they can move a little faster. And, okay, let's talk about if you could break up into quarters. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, beginning fall, end fall, beginning spring, end spring. Where are you if you get to about middle of the way in the fall? Okay. Where are you at at that point? And I say that with a grain of salt because I know it, that's, it, that could be it, it a moving target. It will vacillate, absolutely, right. because every class is different. Um, but in the ballpark area, about the middle of the first semester, we we should be able to start making great sounds on. It, it'll be a few notes, but like you need to be able to sound like a professional on the on that. So it's the teacher doing a lot of modeling and like display this back, and it's kind of almost like a Suzuki approach to it. Sure. Um, don't put any barriers in front of the students with things that they can't read. Let's keep it as easy as possible. There are mirrors in front of every student because that's their best teacher. Um, I can tell you everything, but if you can see it and hear me tell you, then I think there's a better chance that you're gonna be able to fix those problems and without standing in front of the student to tell them it's a, one of those ideas that our staff has been really coached and they do a great job of being behind the student to do it. And that way there's no um, barrier for them to stare because kids just really wanna please you all the time anyway. Right. Um, so we're, we're focusing on making great sounds on the few notes that we know and being able to while maybe not even play the music, be able to sing and say the letter names and things while we're learning different rhythm concepts and building on those things. Um, by the end of that semester, though, when we're getting ready for that uh, Christmas concert, we should have a good solid six great notes that are awesome. Um, I think it's sometimes too, and I keep talking about problems that I see, but I mean, this is just real. Um, sure. People try to play things that are way too hard at their sixth grade concert. And while mom and dads are, they're, they're going to love what their kids are doing. They've spent a lot of money and they see that their kids are enjoying playing their instruments. But I think it makes more sense to make it easier for everyone, play something simple that's just going to sound great. Because if they have that sound concept in their ear, it will always be in their ear. And then when they are able to move on their instruments, um, everything's going to sound great. Well, talk to me more. You mentioned something about making those kids sound pro, mm -hmm. right? 
and uh, one of our mutual friends was talking to me about what he thinks about your band program and that he, th he feels that there's something that you do that makes those kids really sound like mature musicians, right? And if you're expecting them to sound pro right then at the beginning, how do you, how do, you do that? How do you impart to that kid in the fall who's been playing for one or two months, mm -hmm. how do you impart to them a pro sound? I think being music educated, you've got to be a pro on your instrument anyway. And I mean, whether you're not playing as much as you did maybe before, like when you were in college, cause sometimes we get the band director chops, um, you still have to sound amazing. So if they've got you as a model always, then they should always have that sound, right? No, make it sound like mine, do this. And as long as you're using specific enough terminology and, and keeping as simple as always, they should be able to do what you're asking them to do. I play, you play, let's do it that way. But there's always great recordings that you can use of things that are part of your sound concept that you like. Um, having your older students come in and be mentors for those students too. I think those students really take a lot of pride in what's coming up in their band program. Well, we started this way, we want this tradition of excellence to stay. Well, this is gonna be my sixth grader, so sure. this is my responsibility and I want them to sound like me, so here we go. And it really kind of writes itself when you right. do things like that. So it's a lot of modeling and you're hearing, making them always hear what you want them to hear. Right, right. Okay, so as we're going through the year and you were talking about, um, you know, five or six notes or whatnot by the holiday concert, and a lot of times people feel like I need to do more. I want to engage them more. Mm -hmm. How do you engage your students with only a few notes? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes people think more music, more notes, more interest. Mm -hmm. but more problems. <laughs> yeah, more, yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and it really sounds like what you're saying to me is you, you're really prioritizing those uh, pillars that you've already set up mm -hmm. and, and you won't let, you'll let the time take its course because yes. you have to have that foundation. But how do you still engage your kids in that? I think there's so many, like, there's so many simple tunes. I mean, if you're really just concerned about them playing something that's familiar that you could write out and make sound great, but you've got to kind of be an edutainer. Kids will do anything for a sticker. And so if you prioritize and have like a six second chair test and say, all right, we're going to, today we're going to have our chair test on sitting up for six seconds. And you're literally going to check and make sure that you're seeing every kid every day. Um, and I, I'm, I forgot who I got this concept from. None of this is original, but it works so well. You, the six second chair test allows you to see every kid. You only spend six seconds and you only use three chairs. Um, so the, the first chair will be the person who's got the best posture. Um, you, all your second chairs are one that need a little extra help, and your third chairs are probably the ones that need to sit a little closer to you the next time. <laughs> so you can keep working on that posture. But at the end of that chair test, all right, so if I, if I told you you were first chair, raise your hand. If you've got 15 kids, raise, raise your hand. Oh, they're all first chair, but they all get to go tell the mom they were first chair. Right. It's, it's little things like that that make them take some ownership into the program and they go back and tell their parents, hey, I'm first chair. Like, oh, well, they don't know other 15 other kids right. were first yeah, chair, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's little things like that. that I really love that six-second chair test thing. Yeah. I, I'm definitely going to use that. I wrote that down in my notes. <laughs> that <laughs> sounds fantastic. That. It's awesome. Okay, so uh, if we're going through the year, let's, let's step it now into uh, the beginning of the spring okay. towards... And you're not quite at the end of the year yet, but for me, that's my big time for UIL for my other groups. It's always hard for me. I feel like as a middle school director, we have layers. I okay. always have the fifth grade layer of kids coming in, my sixth grade layer, yes. and then my advanced layer. Which are all important. You gotta right, and so, and so sometimes I feel like in uh, my contest is before spring break. I feel mm -hmm. like February and uh, March, yes. my beginners start to get less of priority in my mind. How can I keep that going and keep those kids going in that time? Well, they're a different class periods, so I don't think you should, right. like, it should ever let that become an issue, but you got to think about that being the future of your program. Sure. Um, but by that time, I think they're starting to sound pretty good, and then they're going to have a lot more investment in their instrument, because once they start sounding great, they're going to want to do more, so right. that's when you get to start adding little scale patterns and things like that. Um, first and second studies at a simple level. Do them in quarter notes and things like that at a slow tempo so that they're starting to build tempo, uh, they're starting to build their own technique. But that's when you're introducing scales and there's so many finger patterns within books that you can like can copy and transfer to any instrument. Because I always tell teachers, especially the young ones, don't let your flute player and your tuba player be at different levels. Because once they get that mentality, your flute players run off and they take away and your tuba players are left playing one to five forever right. and they never have any technique. So go slow and make it sound great. And I, I think that ease is facilitated by just making things feel comfortable for you. So if you can do it and make it 
make it easy for yourself at a slow tempo, then things go well. Just don't go fast. Wait, it'll happen. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I constantly find myself getting impatient. Well, now, tell me about, let's just imagine the bottom performing 2% okay. and the top performing 2% <laughs> of your kids, okay? So let me say the top performing 2% mm -hmm. in your beginner class are the kids that they're going they're going they're, yeah, they yeah and they want more and they they go home and they find the YouTube videos and they find the YouTube music and they, yeah. they, you know those kids uh -huh. and you have the bottom performing two percent that um, it's not because they're in a disciplined way or anything like that but it's, it's maybe that kid that you've used I've used every single thing in my tool bag to try to get that child to understand and conceptualize the sound what's your strategy at that point what do you do those are individual listening assignments, those types of things, and you've got to find little exercises that are specific to that kid that'll let them know that, hey, this is something, hey, you still got to work on. This, my rule in the band hall is I'm always going to be honest with you. I'm never going to be mean. If it's great, I'm going to throw a biggest pep rally. If it's not great, I'm going to tell you, hey, we need some work on this. I'm not going to belittle you because it's not your fault. Obviously, I, there's something as a teacher I need to be helping you do too. Um, but it's, it's a little individualized instruction, just like you do with your students who are ahead of the game and you right. give them excitement to say, okay, you're ready for this. Let's push past. You got to do that for your remediation because you, you're, sometimes it's those lower kids are the ones that are going to be the bulk of your band later. Because sometimes, I mean, you've got, you got your all-star kids that are a part of everything. And unfortunately, sometimes we lose those kids. Let's just be really honest. I, I think that's a part of any program. Now, we don't want to lose them, but if, if you're only geared towards one type of student and then that student leaves, what are you left with? Right, right. So exactly. it's just about building from the bottom, individualizing and, and making the kid feel like they're special and just helping them until they get it. Because sometimes you've got late bloomers. I remember, Specifically, I remember we had a student um, in sixth grade who could barely even make a sound on, on her flute. It just took her a while to figure it out. She was a four-year All-Stater. It just <laughs> takes it takes some wow. time. Yeah. Wow. That's a great story. So, I know that you have something you got to get to, and I don't want to take up too much more of your time here. I hope that we can get you on and we can talk some more specifics Absolutely. on our podcast again. I really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thank this you is for fantastic. And every time I get to talk to you, I learn something. So now I'm glad I have it on film. All right, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get you on the podcast again soon. Fantastic. And uh, uh, again, Corey Graves. And we're really, really happy to have you here. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Beyond the Club. <laughs>